understanding the truth about living in a technology world? Well, first of all, they are predicting that by 2017 that the global cybersecurity market is expected to go from $64 billion in 2011 to $120 billion. Well, why so much? Why such an increase? Well, the issue here is really that cybercrime is up. Cybercrime is a growing industry. The returns are really great for the hacker, and the risks are extremely low. It's estimated that an annual cost globally will be over $375 billion, and that's being very conservative. There are some estimates that go up to $575 billion. Now, let's put that in perspective. If you took all the revenues from the top technology companies, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, Apple, and Netflix combined, you wouldn't get close to what cybercrime is doing. Let's look at this a different way. The cybercrime victims per year is over 566 million victims. Let's break that down. That equals out to be 1.5 million victims per day or 18 victims per second. Now, the cost of cybercrime includes not only the effects to businesses, but also to hundreds of millions of people globally. Over 657 million identities will be exposed, and a majority of those will end up being stolen. In fact, of that, 40 million were from the United States, 54 million from Turkey, 20 million from Korea. This isn't just a single country issue. This is a global issue. And the cost of cyber crime will continue to increase as businesses move more of their functions to an online presence and as more companies and customers around the world get connected. And again, this is not limited to just a single or just a couple industries. Some of the most heavily hit industries for data breaches, you can see are healthcare and businesses well, well beyond banking and government and education. And a lot of times people look at that and they go, well, I would think that banking would be a bigger hit. Well, not really. Think about the information I can gather from healthcare. Tons of identity information, social security numbers, income. Businesses is going to be your customer base. Businesses also include the loss of intellectual property. This is a big issue. We've got major countries that are stealing intellectual properties from other countries, and they'll continue to do that so long as the acquiring countries improve their ability to make use of this information and to manufacture competing goods. One of our biggest issues is how it's controlled. Governments have got to get serious about somehow controlling this environment. I'm not saying government control, but prosecution. I mean, think about this one. If you come home and somebody's broken into your front door, who do you call? Right. Police, local police, they come out and they help you out, right? If somebody steals your credit card, okay, granted, you may contact your credit card company and say, hey, there's a weird charge on my card and they refund that. But who goes after that person? How do you go after somebody in a completely different country? So I got to ask you the question, how protected do you feel? Let's take a look at what's going on right now. This is a live cyber threat map showing us live attacks going on. Did you know that in 1984, there was only a thousand devices on the internet as a whole? In 1992, there was 1 million devices. In 2008, there were a billion devices. 2014, they estimate that there is 1.4 trillion devices on the internet. And by 2015, it's supposed to increase by 30%. That would bring us up to 4.9 trillion devices on the internet. In 2011, did you know that 20 homes generated more traffic than the entire internet of 2008? And if you think that's amazing, 90% of the world's data has been created in just the past two years. Now, here's the scary part. More than 600,000 Facebook accounts are compromised every single day. And one in 10 social networking users actually admit to falling victims to some type of phishing scam or scam or fake link that's posted on the social network platforms. 59% of the ex-employees, this is kind of a scary one too, 
59% of ex-employees who leave the company admit to stealing company data when they leave their jobs. So I ask you again, how protected do you feel? Well, that's what we're here to show you. We're going to go through and talk about the different attacks that are hitting companies worldwide. Whenever I teach ethical hacking, it's funny. I have my students come in on the first day and they're like, yeah, hacking, here we go. And that's great. I want you to be excited about it. By day two, they go, huh, that's kind of interesting. Day three, they go, wait a second. Day four, they're going, hang on, hang on, hang on. And on day five, they're typically, holy cow, I got to go back and rethink things. In fact, I'm going to go back and rethink my home network. Folks, it's time to wake up. I don't care if you're here for the Certified Ethical Hacking Certificate to take the exam or not. This knowledge is not only beneficial, it is imperative that you learn this. So come with me and let's get started. So first, what does certification bring you? A lot of times we take an exam, we get a certification and we get that certificate. We put it on our wall for about the first year and then it ends up on our dartboard. <laughs> or it becomes a doorstop. Well, when it comes to certification with CEH, you need to understand that the C that this certification actually brings to you an international recognized certification. This is one that's known throughout the entire IT industry. It is in fact an industry standard. So much so that the CEH certification actually meets the Department of Defense Directive 8570.1, which basically is a directive that it came out and said anybody that deals in the IT side of things when it comes to government, uh, it has to have some type of certification, CEH being one of those. As far as benefiting your resume is concerned, CEH will actually help stand, make you stand out as someone who understands how a hacker thinks. The most recent survey in 2015 showed that a certified ethical hacker, their salary range is anywhere from $25,000 up to $111,000 per year. And obviously with everything that's been going on in this world as far as hacking and technology is concerned, this certification is in high demand. Just because the aspect that it again is teaching you to be more proactive than reactive to what's happening. So you may ask yourself, well, should I be watching this series of courses? Well, that depends. The folks that are going to get the most out of this particular course are going to be those that are security officers within their company, possibly also auditors. And this could be both internal auditors or external auditors, security professionals, and this would include consultants, site administrators, as well as just standard administrators. And also anybody or anyone that might be worried about how secure their environment is. I could actually make an argument for home users to be interested in this course. So how do you maintain your certification? You go off, let's say you go off and get your certification. There are actually some things that you have to do to maintain it. First of all, it's all about the points. EC Council came up with what they refer to as the EC Council Continuing Education Credits. Now these credits are basically points that are given to you based off of activities to show that you're keeping up with the industry. Some of those activities can include attending different conferences. In fact, EC Council puts on two different conferences or they sponsor them, one of them being Takedown and the other one being the Hacker Halted Conference. You can also get credits for attending Black Hat or any other security related conference. If you write any type of research papers concerning security, maybe some of your experiences, or maybe you've come up with a new way of looking at a particular vulnerability, can count as an ECE credit. Training, if you do any type of teaching or training, whether it's internal, or I actually do several community training sessions, and I'm able to gain points for doing those particular free sessions. I, I volunteer my time. Also reading related subject materials. Now, just don't make things up. And that matter of fact, that applies to everything here. Don't say, well, yeah, I wrote a research paper because when you go to fill out the form to apply for these credits, they'll ask for evidence. In some cases you have to fax over 
the materials that you read or give them links to the research papers that you created. Uh, you sometimes have to provide the certificate for the training maybe that you attended, if you attended training, or a receipt showing that you went to one of those conferences. Exams, as I mentioned before, CEH is not the end of your quest. We can go on to other certifications, but if you need to renew your certification in CEH, which if you keep up on your points, you shouldn't have to. Uh, if by chance you miss out on getting enough points, you'll have to take the exam again to make sure that you're up to date. But if you continue on with a forensics expert or a uh, LPT, those exams will also count towards your ECE credits. Webinars, attending webinars, again, you're gonna have to provide some type of evidence that you attended these webinars, but if they're security related, keep track of those things and you'll need to submit those. So how do you submit them? Well, first of all, you have to, these points are cumulative every year or in a yearly fashion or yearly time frame, and it starts from January 1st till December 31st. And during that time frame, you should be tracking all of your activities that would meet these guidelines. And then you'll have until February 1st of the next year to record all your ECE credits. And I would recommend not waiting till January 25th to get going. You want to get these out as soon as possible, maybe even as you attend. And you'll have access to do this. I'll show you here in just a second where you go to uh, apply for these points. But... EC Council has to verify. They don't just take it for granted that, hey, yeah, you said you did this. This is one of the few companies that I've seen that actually goes through and does a lot of verification. So make sure that you get those recorded by February 1st. As far as how do you record your ECE credits? Well, it's very easy. Once you get your certification, you will receive an invitation to the Aspen website, which is basically a website. Uh, it used to be called Delta for certified ethical hackers or anybody that has a EC Council certification. And from there, there is a link that you will go through and click on and submit your ECE credits. Now, if you have any questions about some of your credits, you can always contact EC Council. They're very friendly about answering, you know, does this particular situation apply uh, or would it uh, be one that would get me some credits? They'll be more than happy to help you out with that. At the time of this recording, there was the rumor going around that starting in 2015, they may actually start charging a annual fee as well. But you'll want to check with EC Council to see if that actually took place. So what's expected of you? As a certified ethical hacker, there are several things that you have to adhere to. One of those being the code of ethics, which you can go through and take a look at in detail at the following URL. So the domains of the Code of Ethics from EC Council include the following. First, it comes to when it comes to privacy, obviously as a security professional, uh, you're going to come across information. Uh, and that information you're not allowed, you're not supposed to collect, give, sell, trade, transfer, do anything with that information. So security numbers, uh, customer databases, et cetera. When it comes to intellectual property, again, you're going to be exposed to a lot of information. And again, you as a ethical hacker are going to help protect that information for the, your customer or for your company. Disclosure. Disclosure, you may uncover some things that in some cases may actually be uncomfortable to talk about. Uh, I had a particular situation where the gentleman who hired us to come out to do a pen test, we came across some information. We'll just say it was of adult uh, uh, orientation, adult materials. Uh, and it was one of the no-nos of that company. And we had to expose that information. So you have to be willing to disclose everything that you discover to the appropriate person, and in some cases, authorities. Uh, when I had my ISP service, I had a particular customer that we weren't necessarily monitoring what people were doing. We had a proxy server, and in reviewing the proxy server, we saw some material that was considered that is considered illegal in the United States go across, and we turned that person in. Areas of expertise. You should never misrepresent yourself, pretending that you know more than what you really know. 
You need to be honest and upfront about any limitations that you actually might have in either your experience and or your education. There's nothing wrong with letting people know by saying, hey, this may be outside of my realm. Hopefully you have a network that you can bring in somebody that may have an expertise in that particular domain. Unauthorized usage. You should never knowingly use software or products that are obtained either unethically or illegally. Illegal activities. As you go through and you represent yourself as an ethical hacker, there may be situations that you have to make sure that you stay clear of, such as double billing or seeing that a particular project may or may not take a certain length of time and you do things that extend out your time so you can bill them for more financial gain. We would also include bribery. Uh, there are many situations where you might come across something and as you're talking about it to uh, an individual or a person within that company, there may be some type of bribery that may take place. And again, your job is to make sure you maintain that code of ethics. Authorization. As either a contractor or possibly an employee of a company, you need to make sure that you use their property in a way that is authorized and that it is to their knowledge and consent. We don't ever do things sneakily behind the door. Disclosure. Now, I know I mentioned disclosure previously. It's our third pull it down, but this is a different type of disclosure. There are many times that as you're doing pen tests or you're doing ty uh, simulations, you might come across issues that you need to verify or excuse me, you need to notify a hardware manufacturer that you've discovered something. There was a great article that I was reading by a pen tester who was uh, going through and he discovered a flaw and it was a flaw on a hardware device that gave immediate and instant root access. And he went through and before he would talk about it on his blog, he notified the manufacturer and his frustration came from the manufacturer not necessarily taking the steps as quickly as he thought they should. It actually took over a hundred and some odd days for them to actually respond and finally for them to come public with the information. In the meantime, this ethical hacker was concerned that there were 25,000 plus users of this particular hardware device that were currently being exposed. So if you come across some type of a flaw, you do need to notify the manufacturer so that you can help fix other customers. If by chance they don't respond, I would probably, and this is actually what the author did, is he went through and started posting his frustration on Twitter and made sure he tagged this particular manufacturer so they could see that he was getting ready to announce it. And it wasn't until he got very close to finally coming out and telling everybody what the flaw was that they actually responded and came out with a fix. It was actually for a NAS device, uh, a business level NAS device, which was kind of interesting. Management. Anytime that you get involved in a project, you need to make sure that you have good management procedures in place so that you can make sure that Again, this kind of goes back to the issue of billing. You need to make sure you manage your projects appropriately. Make sure you have a goal and a time frame. And if you're going to have to adjust that time frame, you're going to manage it by letting people know. Knowledge sharing. As an ethical hacker, you need to add to the knowledge of e-commerce professionals by continually studying and sharing the things that you learn and the experiences you come across with fellow EC Council members and help to promote public awareness. I do this all the time by doing free community lectures on their, their focus towards the end user because I think that's our biggest flaw out there right now is so many people don't know what they have in their homes and they don't know how to secure it. But we need to share that information and, and try to promote a public awareness. Confidence. As an ethical hacker, you should always present yourself in a professional and ethical and competent matter. This means even when you're possibly competing with someone else for a particular project. In layman's terms, no backstabbing, folks. Extreme care. Now, as we go through all the different courses in this series, we're going to be introducing some tools that can be extremely dangerous. 
So as an ethical hacker, you need to make sure that you conduct yourself and the software and the things that you deploy against a network, that you will have experience with those products and you're not going to willy-nilly just execute some program on someone's network. You're going to do this extremely carefully. And when you come across a situation, we don't necessarily fix the situations that may or may not be in our scope of our project. And even though we may think we know what's best for their company or for our company, we're still going to get guidance and clearance for any type of action. Malicious activities. Again, you are not going to associate with any type of malicious hackers or engage in any type of activities that would consider, be considered malicious. No compromise. What we mean by this is that you are in no way going to purposely compromise or cause a company or organization system to become compromised through the process of your professional dealings with them. Legal limits. You're going to make sure that as you do these penetration tests that everything that you're doing has been approved, authorized, and it was within the legal limits of the scope of your project. I know there's some really fun movies out there, you know, where people are doing these tests and coming across information, doing things that may or may not be legal. That is not your purpose. Your purpose is to make sure you stay within those guidelines. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on when we talk about pen tests, that we are going to have a scope that we set up, that we understand exactly what it is we're doing, what our limitations are. We got to actually know where the goalposts are and where the sidelines are, what's considered out of bounds. What's considered fair play? Involvement. As an ethical hacker, you are making a pr promise. You're going <laughs> to adhere to the code of ethics that you will not partake in any black hat activities or be associated with any black hat communities that are out there trying to endanger people's networks infrastructure. Now, that doesn't mean that and we'll talk about this with vulnerability research. That doesn't mean that you're not monitoring them but you're not gonna help promote them. You're not gonna help solve their problems, especially when it comes to dealing with online forums, which gets us to the last one, which is underground communities. So again, you are not going to be a part of any underground hacking communities for the purpose of being evangelist or expanding the black hat knowledge or their activities. If you see something happening, again, I monitor, some of these communities to see what the big shindig is out there. And then I know that I use that as my part of my utility belt. There's my Batman reference, <laughs> part of my utility belt. So I know what hackers are thinking. Again, I would need to get this across to you. You should be thinking like a hacker. You are a profiler. And in order to understand the enemy, you've got to know what the enemy is doing and what they're up to. Okay, there's one more item that it's expected of you. You should review, we refer to it as the CCA or the Candidate Certificate Agreement. This is available via the EC Council website in the URL listed here. In it, they go through and list the purpose of the certification, the definition, uh, the certification itself, uh, if you can transfer the certification, like if you leave a company, the answer is no, you can't. Certification stays with the person. Your obligations, they actually have a link there to your, the certification exam as well as the exam retake. But we'll cover some of this in a later module. And terms and termination, as well as if you break, for example, the code of ethics, somebody can report you or you can report someone else if you need to. So make sure you review that as well. So in this module, we went through and took a look at what certification brings to you. It brings, again, a global recognized certification. In fact, I was just reading an article the other day about how the FBI is looking for ethical hackers. We also spoke to how to maintain your certification. Remember, it's all about the points. Again, you're gonna wanna make sure that uh, any changes, EC Council is pretty good about notifying members if they make any types of changes. If you have a question about if something or some activity could be considered for points or ECE points, you need to contact them and, and just ask them outright. Then we also talked about what was expected of you. There's a lot expected of you. Again, go back to my favorite quote from Uncle Ben, Spider-Man, 
What did he say before he died? With great power comes great responsibility. Don't take this lightly, folks. This is uh, uh, the materials that you're going to learn about can be and are dangerous in the wrong hands. And that's not the purpose of us teaching these concepts is to put them in the wrong hands. Okay, before we dive in further, we're going to go through in the next module and show you how to build up a lab that you get a hack. It's way cool, guys.